Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? How is everyone? Welcome to uh, Tinker Like It's Thursday. God, I had to think then. It is Thursday. It's Tinker Like It's Thursday. It's Dr. Chip's Daily Dose. Welcome to anybody that hasn't joined us before and joining us for the first time this morning. Um, and welcome back to our regulars. So, got a really interesting one for you this morning. Really looking forward to doing this. It's Make a Me this morning. We're actually going to be making and tinkering with models of human organs to learn about how they work. So, that's going to be cool. Now, I can see, unfortunately, the camera seems to be a little bit stuttery this morning, but I think you should be hearing me okay. I just look like a robot moving. Uh, yes, um, but um, hopefully that will settle down and the main thing is that the uh, tabletop cam here is working good and well because I'm going to be showing you how to make a heart, a model of the heart and a model of the lungs. But as we always do, first of all, we're going to jump onto the showcase blog. If you're new, the way it works is that if you uh, follow one of the daily doses and you send in your work, then I will put your work up onto our showcase blog, which is, uh, I got it the wrong way around, at that website and that is the email that you need to use to contact me. Only thing to remind everyone, don't include pictures of your faces, children's faces in them, just include the work or take photos so that you can't see actually uh, the people's faces in it. You might see the back of their head, etc. So, okay, let's jump onto the showcase blog and share the work that came in from yesterday's bird inspiration session. So let's jump onto the screen down here. Uh, there we go. Okay. So let's go across to the showcase blog. And I had lots of people sending in their work, which is absolutely super. I say it every time, but I really do love seeing the work that you've done at home and sent in. So let's have a look at some of these. Um, we've got now Isabella I've sent, has sent in another video. So yesterday's lesson, just for anyone that didn't watch, was learning about evolution by looking at how birds' beaks are different shapes and sizes. And this was sort of recreating a bit of an investigation that Charles Darwin did in the Galapagos Islands when he started to formulate his ideas around this theory of evolution. So I'm going to pull my mic out, as I always do. It's going to be quiet for a little bit. And then we're going to be able to hear uh, the videos that are on here as well. So just give me 30 seconds. Out it comes. Interesting. Yay. Right, you're back. Okay, so here we go. First of all, Isabella's fantastic video of her doing the experiment from yesterday. So yesterday we looked at how different beaks might sometimes give us an advantage or a disadvantage with eating particular foods. And we were simulating the different length beaks using things like chopsticks, or I think they're like sort of kebab skewers you've got there. Oh, that makes me think I love a, a Friday night kebab. Maybe I'll have that tomorrow. Um, and there, so you gave yourself 30 seconds, I think, there with those kebab skewers simulating a long beak and now looking using a bulldog clip to sort of simulate trying to eat with a smaller beak let's see how we get on there oh it's a little bit tricky is it so actually what might be the case here is that neither of those birds beaks were suited to that environment with that food so you probably, in that environment, with that type of food, you probably wouldn't find very many birds with the type of beaks that you're simulating. So very well done to Isabella. Oh, just in time there. Zero for that one. <laughs> well done. Um, pupils from uh, Crab Lane were tuning in yesterday. Sky, Misha and Jacob and uh, Miss Owen sent in some pictures of you uh, taking part in yesterday's Daily Dose. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, and you can see you recorded down there the, the different types of beak and then how much of each of the different types of seed they were able to eat. Nancy sent me some work that she'd done on 
top of the sort of the experiment had gone and done a bit of research on different types of beaks and I did say go and find out a little bit more about these animal adaptations whether it's birds or I was telling you about my favorite adaptation is explains why my cat's belly hangs down a little bit low underneath him Amanda Amanda I love this photo this is so arty and organized and it's just a wonderful photo so um, Amanda, you would uh, sent in a video as well. We'll watch that in a second. But you took part. You're from Longfield Primary School in Harrow. Um, and look at all the different foods that you were simulating and the different length beaks. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, let's have a look at your video here. That's fantastic. Now, I'm not going to play... I'm going to skip it on a little bit to show what you you're doing there, but I've got to be a little bit careful with having other music in my video here because YouTube won't like that. But I can see that you've been trying all of the different um, seeds and then the different beaks on those different seeds as well. So that was fantastic. Uh, yep, all good, all good. Just checking that uh, that little clip of music hadn't triggered any uh, algorithms to take me down. But no, we're all good. Jack Thorley, regular Jack. Um, you'd sent in what you had been up to, you'd summarised some research on different animal adaptations um, and how they are adapted to their habitats, such as the kingfisher, etc. Um, fantastic. The Welsh boys, uh, regulars, also took part. And from the day before, Mum clarified for me that um, the step in their workout that I couldn't quite um, see clearly was a mummy walk. So holding your hands out like a mummy, I think it was, and doing a walk like that, which is great. Very creative uh, workout move to include. Um, oh, Isabella, I appear to have added your video twice there. There we go. I thought it was that good. I've put it up twice. Everyone can watch it twice. Hassan, thank you for... Uh, sending in your work. Hassan likes to use the daily dose to practice his English and writes out the instructions to the experiment as well. So thank you for sending that in. Inez, uh, thank you for sending in your picture, another one of our regulars. There you are with some tweezers uh, simulating a bird's beak eating some food. Sakib has done some fantastic research on different animals and how some of their characteristics suit their environments, animals like the largest pelican, um, largest bird of prey. Yeah, I'm guessing it's a condor. Yes, that was it. I read it when you sent it in yesterday. It's a condor with a 3.2 meter wingspan. That's just incredible. So 3.2 meters. So that's far taller. Their wingspan is far greater than my height. Um, fantastic. Now, Paige um, found that the peg beak was very good at picking up seeds and um, paper clips but could not pick up the worms which you had as hair bands. Yeah, so that's exactly it. Different birds have evolved, have different type of beaks depending on what they eat. So well done to all of you and um, thank you for sending those in to go on the showcase blog. I also have to skip back down here to share with you as well. Oh no, I haven't put it up. Right. Um, I'm very sorry uh, that I haven't put it up. I've got a note here. Um, Algara and Fintan, um, who I'm sure it was yourselves that created this incredible suspension bridge that I wanted to put up and I've completely forgotten. I thought I had, which is why I was going to share it with everyone, but I haven't. But I will put it up this weekend and I will share that with everybody on Tuesday. Everyone else, you, you've got to see these bridges to believe that how amazing they are. They've created their own suspension bridges. So I will share those next week. So well done to everyone there. Let me pop my microphone back in and we will go back to today's experiment. hear me can you hear me yes back okay right i'm still a little bit juddery there but we should be okay right so today's experiment um oh sorry one last thing before i do morning register as always uh dave and george tuning in hi to you both um and uh i've also noted that you put in your answer to the riddle as well and i will share that uh everyone that got the riddle from yesterday right 
at the end of today. Just to remind you, the riddle was what goes up but never comes down. So if you didn't tune in yesterday, but you're watching today, you can be thinking about that, what goes up but never comes down. And I'll share that with you at the end, along with the riddle from me to be thinking about over the weekend. Right, so make a me. Today we're gonna make um, a model of the human heart, a simplified model. We're gonna focus on the important bit, an abstraction, making links to computational thinking Tuesdays, and a model of the uh, lungs. We're gonna start with the lungs, and I've got a question for you. How do you breathe in? Very simple question. We breathe in and out about 25,000 times a day on average, but how do we actually do it? How do we get air down into our lungs? And this is a question I always ask my year sixes when I teach them about this, and they go, oh yeah, good question, Dr. Chips. I never really thought of that. How actually do we do it? I mean, we don't push the air in. We don't go, Ugh. we don't really bite it. Um, we just, breathe it in, but what are we actually doing? What's our body doing to breathe that air in? Everyone breathe in for me. After three, one, two, three. What are you actually doing in your body to get that air to go in your mouth, down, your, down into your lungs? Okay, now that, is the thing we're gonna explore this morning. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you how to make a model to explain how, uh, how we actually do that. And, and let me just show you this picture of the lung, scientific drawing here, because, and uh, you can go and Google, um, you know, uh, diagrams of human lungs and you'll start to see some really cool scientific diagrams like this one, um, which shows the lungs, which are part of the respiratory system. Uh, I can never say, I, I, it turns out I've always been saying it the American way, respiratory, but it's respiratory. I don't know where I've got the American pronunciation from, but I'm changing it now, so respiratory. Um, so, the, uh, and, and the key for this morning, the main thing for us this morning is we're gonna learn about this thing that sits beneath our lungs. It's a muscle called the diaphragm, okay? You can see it labeled at the very bottom there, the, uh, the word on the bottom left, diaphragm. It sounds, it's spelt as if it should be like diaphragm, but it's diaphragm. And what we're gonna do is we are going to make a model of the lungs, uh, including this diaphragm, and that's gonna explain to us actually what's in happening inside of our body to get the air in. So let's go for it. Let's switch to the table um, because I think this is working better anyway. Yes, it is. And I'm gonna show you how to make your model of lungs. Now for this, um, all you need is one plastic bottle and you cut the end off, okay? Oh, and by the way, just, just watch this. Don't try and go along with me because uh, I'm probably gonna go a little bit too quick just to do the whole daily dose and then you can go away and watch this back and, uh, and make your model. So. First of all, plastic bottle. Now this is gonna represent our sort of body, human body. It's actually representing what we call chest cavity inside, but it's human body. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a balloon here. I've gone for a pink one actually, uh, that was just by chance, but to make it more lung-like. I'm just gonna blow it up just to loosen it a little bit. There we go. Um, because they were sticking together. And we're gonna place our balloon in the top here, like so. And then we're just going to pull the top, sorry, pull the balloon, the end of the balloon to go around the top of our bottle, like so. There we go, perfect. Okay. Now this is a simplified model, it's an abstraction um, of the, the, the lung system uh, in that we've just got one lung, we've got the bottle representing the chest cavity, and then what we're gonna do is we are going to um, create a, we're gonna make part of the model 
um, to represent the diaphragm. Okay, so that diaphragm that was on that diagram, it's a muscle. And it's a muscle that sits under your lungs and goes right across. So it creates a seal under your lungs, make sure everything then in, in there is what we call airtight. And it's a muscle, just like any other muscle, like the muscles in your arms, you can contract them and they bring about movement or you can relax them, okay? So the diaphragm is a muscle just like uh, other muscles in our body and we can move it. Now, what we're going to do to create uh, the part of the model for our diaphragm is we're going to use either a bit of plastic bag or a bit of bin bag, okay? Um, so I'm going to use a bit of bin bag here and all I'm doing just off screen is cutting it and give me one second and I will be back. Yes, I'm back. There we go. Okay. And I'm just going to get some bin bag and I'm going to tape it across the bottom. All right. Now, really important when I was saying before about it being airtight this needs to be airtight, okay? Lots of processes in the body work because everything is sealed and it uses chain, what we call changes in pressure, which we're going to explore in just a minute when I've finished building this. Um, so we're going to put our diaphragm across the bottom and we're going to take some tape and we're going to stick it on, okay? And it's a bit tricky. You might need to get someone to sort of hold it. Normally, I would get my science ambassador to come out at this point. But obviously, I'm on my own. There we go. And let's get that on there like so. Now, okay, I need to just... Oh, see, now look. Can you see that little hole there? This will not work if there is a hole. All right, so I'm going to... Make sure I cover that up. Okay, it's, it's not airtight, it won't work. And in fact, I hope I haven't put a hole in the actual bin bag. No, I haven't, we're okay. Right, so now we've got our model of the human lung, simplified model. And I'm gonna show you how this can, by tinkering with this, we can actually learn the answer to that original question, how do we get air into our lungs? And it's really straightforward, okay? If you notice, when you breathe in, okay, you can feel your kind of chest moves out a little bit, but inside, what happens is that the diaphragm muscle, this diaphragm muscle here, actually moves downwards, okay? It contracts and moves downwards. So we can simulate this by pulling on our diaphragm. Now, when I pull on the diaphragm, watch what happens to our lung. Can you see that? Can you look at it inflating? Okay, and when I push back up, it deflates. Look at this, how cool is this? So pull down, balloon inflates. Obviously the balloon is not completely inflating, um, but air is being drawn into it. And then push up and watch the balloon, totally deflates, down, up. And in fact, look, it's even pushing. We wouldn't want that to happen, our lung to suddenly come out of our mouth. Um, but it's even pushing the balloon up. You can uh, up when I'm pushing it in. So watch that again. So when I want to breathe in, my diaphragm contracts and moves down, okay? and air goes into my lung, and when I breathe out, the way I breathe out is that I push my diaphragm up, okay, and then that causes all of the air to be pushed out of our lungs, and it's as simple as that. So when you get asked that question again, how do we actually get air into our lungs? Well, it's a really simple answer. When we want to breathe in, our diaphragm moves down, and air is drawn into our lungs, and when we breathe out, the diaphragm here uh, pushes upwards, and air comes out of our lungs. Now, the reason that that happens is all to do with pressure. When the diaphragm moves down, it creates a reduction in pressure around the lungs, and because there's a reduced pressure inside and a higher pressure outside, 
the air is actually almost forced down into our lungs because there's a higher pressure here, lower pressure inside. And when we breathe out, we create a higher pressure inside and then the air flows out. It will always go flow from the higher pressure to the lower pressure. So there we go. There's model number one, a huge, simple human lung experiment to show how the diaphragm helps us breathe in. Really important muscle that, the diaphragm muscle, uh, helps us breathe in and out. Oh, and by the way, sometimes the diaphragm muscle, uh, and I use, pretend my, the diaphragm is my hand here, has go, spasms a little bit. So it, the muscle has spasms in it and it might go ding, 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 ding. Can anyone guess what you might get when your diaphragm muscle is spasming like that? What, what, how might that manifest itself? Hmm. Oh, did I hear someone saying it? Hiccups? Yeah, hiccups. Hiccups is when your diaphragm muscle is doing little jolts and spasms, okay, and it gives you hiccups because uh, as it moves like that, it forces the air uh, out very quickly in a short burst, so you get hiccups. So there we go. Right, uh, next then, the heart. Okay, the heart, human body. Let's make a, a model of the heart to explore it a little bit. Now, here's a scientific diagram, um, explanation diagram of the heart. And if you are interested in perhaps coming, becoming a doctor or other medical professional when you are older, you will start to have to learn all of the vocabulary and the correct scientific terminology for different parts of organs like the heart we can see here. We won't get into the real complex detail of it today, but you've got different sizes. You've got the left ventricle, the right ventricle, because the heart is actually two pumps in one. Um, we've got things like the left atrium, the right atrium, there's some really important valves in there which make sure the blood flows in the right direction and doesn't go in the wrong direction. What we're going to do today is we're going to make a very simple model of the heart to show how the heart pumps the blood around the body. Because if you do any kind of exercise, just like we did on Wednesday with our workout. No, hang on. Where was, was that just yesterday? I'm so confused. Tuesday. Tuesday. Oh, we're all losing track of the days. Um, just like we did on Tuesday, you get your heart pumping. You can feel your heart pumping. You can feel the beats, of your, your pulse. Okay. And we're going to make a simple model of the heart to show how the heart like the diaphragm is a muscle, how it moves and how it pumps blood around your body. So to do this one, let's go back to the table because I'm still juttery on there. Uh, first thing you need is a glass of water. Let's go at a little bit of an angle with this one. I think it might be better. Yeah, okay. So you need a glass of water. Um, and then what you need to do is you're going to, this is optional, but it's always good to, to uh, make it look a bit more realistic. We're going to add some red food colouring to turn the water into blood, okay, like so. Now, this glass is going to represent our heart, um, but, and this is a big but, uh, at the moment, this glass isn't a very good representation of our heart in our model because the heart is a muscle. It means that the muscle contracts and relaxes and moves, and we can't obviously get this to, uh, to move. It, the glass is uh, hard and brittle um, and stiff. Those are the correct material uh, vocabulary to describe it. Um, and it means that it won't flex. It's not flexible. It's stiff. So what we're going to do, but we need it for this experiment, we need to use the glass because then it can hold our blood. But then what we're going to do um, is we're going to take another balloon um, and we are going to cut that balloon. Um, so we just cut the kind of tail off. Let me just blowing it. Oh, have we got a red one to make it more realistic? Yes, we do. Here we go. Okay, so we cut the balloon off at about there. 
And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to stretch the balloon if I can get it to open. I don't know why, but these balloons that I've bought, I can't. Once you cut them, then they stick together and you can't get them to open. Oh, come on. Come on, everyone. Cross your fingers. I'm going to be able to get this to... to yes, there we go. Thank you for everyone for crossing their fingers. Okay, so and what you do is you stretch. Now, you will need a little bit of help with this probably, okay? So ask someone at home to help you. Stretch your balloon across your glass and then secure it with sellotape as well. Okay, so let's get this secured. Right, bit of sellotape, round it goes. Now, just like with the model of the heart, sorry, model of the lungs, it's really important that this is airtight. This is another system in our body that relies um, on changes in pressure and things being airtight. If you've got any gaps, it won't work. And this is the tricky part now. What you need to do is we're going to create a very, very small hole in the top of our heart and we're going to insert a straw. And this is going to represent one of the, uh, what we call either veins or arteries that lead into and lead out of the heart. Now we're not going to go into lots of detail today about all of the different um, veins and arteries because there are different ones going into different parts. We're just going to model one um, with our model um, and we're going to model one of those using a straw. Now also I don't have any straws uh, in the previous weeks all I've been doing and I've done exactly the same today is roll up a bit of paper and put some uh, sellotape around it and works just as well. But the trick here is that you can only make a hole, a tiny hole that this just fits in by stretching the balloon. If there's any space around the edge of your straw, it will not work, okay? So you can't make a massive hole. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try using a cocktail stick and I'm gonna push in. Ah, oh, there we go. Right, now, look, when I take it out, you can barely see the hole, even if I go close, you can't see it. And that is just how you want it, okay? Because then what happens, and I've cut a spike on the end of my straw here. So when I then slide it in, okay, very, very carefully and get it in. Come on. Oh, 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 oh. I'm already firing blood everywhere. Okay, yeah, there we go. Okay, I'm in. And can you see that it is completely airtight all the way around my straw. So I haven't cut a huge hole. Um, I've just cut a very, very small hole and it's stretched around the balloon to let my straw in. I'll push it in a little bit more. Right, okay. Right, now, here, the fun bit. I'm gonna place this in a bowl and I'm gonna zoom out a little bit, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna tinker with this to learn about how the human heart works because what the human heart does it's a muscle and just like the diaphragm is a muscle and that was able to contract which is when uh, the muscle fibers overlap more and and the muscle kind of shrinks in size um, the heart can also contract and relax and change in size and what happens when the heart relaxes and contracts is it creates this pumping uh, mechanism uh, and the way it does that we can demonstrate that here because what I'm going to do is I'm going to push down hard on top of the balloon uh, as if the heart was contracting okay and I want you to see what happens to the blood uh, here we go on three two one oh nothing right <laughs> hang on let me just I don't think my straw's in far enough give me one second that was a bit of an anticlimax, wasn't it? There we go, here we go, right, that's better. My straw, I didn't have my straw in far enough. Let's try it again. Three, two, one, hey! Okay, I've got it all over the floor. Let's do that one more time. Oh, now it's really going. Three, two, one. Can you see, look at that. All that happens is you, when the heart contracts, the muscles contract, and squeeze down, we can see how, oh, that has gone everywhere. 
uh, how we can, uh, how it pumps the blood around the body, just like that, okay? Fantastic. Uh, right, let me just dry myself off here. So there we go. There are two make a two experiments today um, for you to go and have a go at and send me pictures of those coming in. Right, so let me just finish by saying if you haven't already, please go to this website and put your email details in so I can send you the email about the daily doses that are coming up next week and what you're going to need for them. Also hit like and subscribe on YouTube here so that keeps you in touch with what I am doing. Um, I am going to go and uh, plan next week's daily doses in a bit and I will send that email out. Some really cool stuff I've already got in my mind. I think we're gonna do a little bit of art meets computational thinking meets coding, which will be really cool on Tuesday. And Wednesday is all about space and rockets. Uh, and I'm just deciding on what to do with Thursday. I've got a bit of an idea, but I won't, don't wanna give it away just yet. Um, so fit to finish, um, the riddle, yesterday's riddle. The question was, what goes up but never comes down? These people got it correct. Ellen, Camilla, Celia, Shane, Kaznika, Grace, Sakib, Ian, Nancy, George. You all got it correct. It is age, which always, always goes up and never comes down. I do like, Dave, your answer though, that in lockdown it's also weight, our weight. I, that made me chuckle. I'll give you a house point for that one. Um, so this riddle, for to keep you occupied until next Tuesday, I'm going to show you on the screen here because it helps you to see this one in person. Well, you see it in person, see it on the screen. What comes once in a minute, twice in a moment, but never in a thousand years? Hmm, it's a tricky one. What comes once in a minute, twice in a moment, but never in a thousand years? If you think you know the answer to that, then send me an email to this email address, let me know, and I will give you a shout out next Tuesday. So I will see you next Tuesday. I'll see tomorrow is a bank holiday. It is VE Day. It's the 75th anniversary of VE Day, which is when uh, it was announced that the war had come to an end in Europe after Nazi Germany's surrender. It's a really important historical date. There will be a two-minute silence at 11, which everyone should follow to recognize the sacrifices that were made by everyone that were part was part of the effort to bring the war to an end. At the moment, we're being asked to make um, sacrifices because of the current situation, but those sacrifices are nothing compared with the sacrifices of our uh, grandparents, parents that um, lived in that time. So it's a really important day to show our respect and remember the sacrifices that those made. So that's happening tomorrow, and then I will be back next Tuesday with three more daily doses. Can't wait to see you then. Get in contact uh, with your work, get on the website, and I will see you next week. Bye for now.